interactive so feel free to you know, ask any questions or uh, you know interrupt me anytime i see the interface for qa is pretty cool here so i'll keep an eye out um let me get started um so I have quite a few slides we don't need to go through all of them uh, i'll mainly be talking about neural learning to rank which is how do we use deep learning techniques learning to rank um, and uh, i'll provide an overview and uh, some interesting work that's being done on our group uh, so i mainly work on tensorflow ranking which is a library for uh, learning to rank uh, so uh, yeah so really presenting uh, work on behalf of uh, several people at google uh, when it comes to the library So overall, this is the outline of the talk. Uh, we'll look at uh, motivate, we'll, we'll motivate why neural networks are useful for uh, ranking, what is learning to rank, uh, and then we'll look at a bit of deep learning and TensorFlow, which uh, many of you might be familiar with. Uh, we'll try to keep it at, at a high level, and then I'll talk a bit about the li library as well. Uh, and we'll look at some empirical results. And finally, there's a link to a hands-on tutorial. Uh, I don't think we'll have the time to do it, but uh, you, know, you can try it out. And if you have any feedback, you can uh, let me know, or uh, we, we have a GitHub page for the library, and you can raise an issue or ask questions. So let's go to motivation. Uh, what is learning to rank? In learning to rank, we essentially want to learn uh, a scoring function f which can learn to reorder items so that items of the highest relevance to the user are placed at the top uh, so it can be seen as uh, taking an unordered set and inducing order on it where the objective is to maximize uh, some notion of And this has applications in several domains like search, recommendation, uh, dialogue systems, question answering. And in general, what we are looking at is how do we learn uh, a scoring function f to sort a list of uh, examples or items. I'll use the terms interchangeably. And uh, the idea is you take in a list of examples, but with also some context. So the context could be, say, query features, or it could be just uh, his user history uh, or user context. Uh, and finally, we want to produce, uh, we want to learn a scoring function that can produce the most optimal example. And traditionally, this uh, there's been a lot of research on using things like, you know, linear networks, uh, support vector machines. <laughs> Also, neural networks, given the recent improvements uh, in, in using neural networks in, in a whole variety of domains. Um, what is the challenge that comes in? Many of the ranking metrics, which uh, uh, we'll look at some of them later, but mainly uh, you, if you look at uh, rank and ranking metrics, they are piecewise cons constant when it comes uh, to scores. So uh, if you have 0 0.9 and uh, 1.1 1 .1 and 0 0.95 and 1.05, they still have the same rank. But the flip happens uh, very quickly when they are super close. So uh, basically, ranking metrics are not usually differentiable. Uh, rank is has this uh, dependency on indicator functions so and rank swaps can easily happen if your scores are noisy so that brings in a challenge when you try to optimize ranking metrics so instead a variety of uh, losses are used to model 
uh, as a proxy for, for ranking. So we look at uh, those categories. One of them is point-wise learning to rank methods where documents are, or items are considered uh, independent of each other, right? And what we are trying to do is for each of them, we try to predict a probability, right? Uh, whether A is relevant or not. So it produces like score between zero to one. Uh, and we are sort of assuming that any user relevance that is obtained, say either by a human uh, rater or through clicks, for example, if it's being shown in uh, search or recommendation. So we use that as label to model this probability uh, as a binary label. This is a somewhat naive model. It's assuming these uh, A, B, and C, their relevances are sampled in a, say, IID manner that this data is IID. We know it's not really IID because these results are shown together uh, because some base rank is thought relevant. Hence, more, uh, slightly more advanced techniques have been considered where instead of looking at documents in isolation, you look at document pairs. Uh, this is really a pretty popular uh, technique across uh, various pro various applications. And the idea is to use, uh, look at pairs, but try to now see as a this pair, which document ranks higher than the other. And uh, a variety of techniques for this and uh, even packages uh, algorithms like say Lambda Mart are popular and then your packages like XGBoost, which uh, given dense features do uh, a really good job uh, of uh, modeling these pairwise interactions. So, so if, I then, may, uh, yeah. if yeah. I may interrupt quickly and, and to bring uh, the audience uh, you know, up to page. Uh, so, so we are talking about uh, matching a, a, a query with a large set of documents, right? Uh, and and right. one way to do the ranking. So we want to get a rank list where the the top rank doc document is relevant to that query. And one way to do that is to right. to give scores to each query document pair. That's the point wise scoring right. scheme, right? And, right. Uh, uh, that's a good point. Yeah. So ba yeah. So basically, you have some context and a list of examples. So it could be like query and a list of documents. And then finally, in this approach, you're trying to do like a score and sort, which is score each query document pair, generate a score. Uh, and during serving time or inference time, you sort all the documents based on that score. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so, so, and so every, all these losses so are... What? Sorry, sorry. Right. Yeah. What I was saying is all, all these losses are trying to... Uh, model like how do we learn such a scoring function f during training time so that during inference you can still do the score and so on. Mm -hmm. Right, and and uh, so you have point wise scores where you can you 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 score each document with respect to query independent of other documents, and then there are these right. pair wise scores where you consider all pairs of documents or a subset. Uh, whatever subset you have generated, because to all pairs right. and you give a score to them, every pair. Is that right? Right. So now for every pair, you have a Boolean, you have, you know, is it, is A better than B or is A worse than B? So now it is a classification problem. Mm -hmm. um, and, and but that, you're still learning that, that, takes that classification is still done on the scores. So you look at the score generate. So F of A is score of A, F of B, score of B, you look at the difference of the scores uh, and you start uh, to create a loss function. Yeah, okay. So, so, the, uh, so the score function is always there and then there are more complex fun functions that are built on top of that. Exactly. So the score function is but then you using the loss function to sort of say that, hey, these are not IIT, these are not all independent uh, things, but they need to be learned together. And the ideal loss function would be the ranking metric itself, 
But since they're not differentiable, we, we create these uh, surrogate losses or proxy losses. And finally, in the listwise learning to rank method, essentially what you're trying to do is you learn all the scores together and uh, it induces a and you do some sort of, an, so you look at a loss function, which basically looks at the induced order from your scoring function and also the order induced by your labels and tries to match the order. Um, so that is what a lot of the listwise learning to rank methods do. We'll look at some of them in detail, but essentially, uh, yeah, the idea is you consider the order of the entire list when you train uh, during training. So we, we have a very quick question. I, usually pair examples are not given in real life. What can be a naive idea to create pairs so that there won't be any data bias? Right. Uh, that's a point. Uh, I think in the pairwise settings, how you sample, say, negatives is pretty important. Like one thing you could do is, say, if your uh, labels are clicks, then you can pick a click document and a document that's not clicked as a pair. You can sample like documents which are not clicked. Uh, so then you're essentially sampling a negative. Uh, that's one way to do it. Then there's a whole lot of literature on how do you do this negative sampling in an intelligent way where you can pick negatives which are, you know, they're not like obviously ir uh, irrelevant, but they might have, you know, the, basically, now you're trying to discriminate between good quality negatives and, say, clicks. Uh, but, yeah, issues of data bias and, like, quadratic complexity do come in. So there's always some some sort of sampling that goes on. And there was a... Kunal, if you can type your question in the chat box instead of Q&A. Uh, his question is, F of A is a... Comparison function between A and query or query is not required? Right. So I've uh, not explicitly mentioned the query, but you can uh, think of uh, query as being an additional feature that is passed to F. Sounds good. Yeah. So, so everybody in the audience, we, we are on a virtual platform. It's a bit restrictive, but please try type in your questions here in the chat box. Some people have already started typing and, and we'll take them on the fly yeah so okay thanks um, yeah please continue yeah um so in the standard learning to rank setting we have uh, say web 30k is uh, a pretty popular data set from microsoft which essentially for a subset of uh, their uh, web scrape what they've done is they've anonymized their features and it has features like TF-IDF scores, BM25, URL length, page quality, etc. And then they ran human relevance judgment on this, where they showed this data to uh, human raters, think Amazon Turkers, and sort of for 30K queries, uh, got uh, human relevance judgment. So this is a proxy, uh, popular benchmark data sets, but proxy for, say, uh, something similar that would happen in a real world recommendation or search system. And relevance judgment would mean score for each or rank or something else? So score for each. So what uh, these have is like a score between, so what the data set actually has four levels of score where each like zero, one, two, three, but each of them means something. Uh, so you can, the, but in many cases, it's just treated as a continuous variable number. You could also have more complex models, which do like a categorical, treated as a categorical variable. But but, but the, basically, the label itself is 0, 1, 2, or 0, 1, 2, or 3. Okay. Saying that 3 is high, highly relevant and 0 is not relevant. Yeah. yeah so it's more so, than a single score. It is roughly, uh, right. yeah, yeah, please. Go ahead. Right. So if you look at like current state of the art, uh, 
so there we see that say neural networks are pretty as competitive sorry that there are uh, uh, methods such as uh, based on say gradient boosted decision trees or particularly a variant of the lambda mart which is pretty competitive on public learning to rank uh, data sets we had a couple of papers from our group which have on uh, many of these data sets shown that neural networks can also be competitive so this slide is somewhat outdated uh, but overall i think uh, ranking is one place where we see that neural networks and you know uh, more traditional techniques like gradient boosted decision trees are competitive and if you look at but when you want to incorporate say sparse features when you want to incorporate embeddings or uh, embeddings extracted from text or video etc that's where you can get a lot more advantage uh, from using neural networks as well so now uh, let's look at neural networks so if we talk about why neural networks for ranking uh so neural networks can also be seen uh, can be seen as complementary to standard learning to rank methods it's not necessarily a direct replacement and in many systems you actually see a uh, pretty decent gains when you ensemble uh, say gradient boosted decision trees with uh, techniques uh, with say neural networks uh, and uh, there's a pretty interesting paper at KDD 2019, which basically does a pretty exhaustive analysis of ways to combine neural networks and GBDTs uh, to, to get a good ensemble performance. And when you have data sets yes, such as... Yeah. If, if I can sorry. interrupt very quickly, so what is the history of uh, so of, of uh, decision trees versus neural ne networks for ranking or such. I presume that uh, before neural networks took over or maybe part of the decision trees uh, or gradient boosted decision trees were the, 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 top, the, the top models that, that were all over the place. Could you talk a bit uh, very quickly about it? Sorry for that. Right. Right. Uh, so Overall, uh, I think when you when you don't so if your features if you don't have like large scale categorical features or if you don't have say image features and text features etc. Then I think we know that gradient boosted decision trees are uh, super competitive. If you look at Kaggle datasets or even in many companies, I think they're still uh, a pretty popular workhorse uh, and also pretty reliable because they. There are fewer variables, fewer hyperparameters to tune. Uh, it's more principled approach. Uh, so even uh, to this day, I think in, in ranking, uh, I wouldn't say like neural networks have completely taken over, say the way they have taken over in some other fields. Uh, but what we do see is uh, say in, and that's where the next slide comes in, say in data sets where uh, you don't have handcrafted dense features, numerical features, but you actually use the raw query and the raw passage information, uh, which is the MS Marco passage re-ranking task where you have a query and you have multiple passages and you have a click, click information of which passage was relevant. And if you try to learn directly from such data, then of course you can't use something like GBDTs. And we see that using neural networks uh, particularly using things like pre-trained models like BERT with learning to rank style losses, which we looked at point-wise, pair-wise, and list-wise losses, tends to be uh, pretty effective. And uh, there are we, we also have some uh, entries on the leaderboard which are pretty competitive with the best models. Yes. Okay. So yeah. overall, Thanks. the motivation, right? So I would say. Why neural networks for ranking? So one thing is that they can be complementary to gradient boosted decision trees or rank SVM, which are pretty popular approaches. Uh, so you can get gains by ensembling. And the second thing is, if you want to learn 
feature representations directly from data that's another place that's another motivation to use neural networks right. and overall even neural models in information retrieval have are becoming more and more popular uh, so if you looked at like percentage of papers uh, so this has not been updated uh, recently but i'm sure that number would only be higher than 42% but we see an upward trend overall in uh, in like using neural networks for information retrieval and there's a lot of focus on using it for matching which is uh, you learn whether a query and document are 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 a good match which is an interesting problem but the rank problem is because now you have a query and a list of documents so it's not only whether a query and document are relevant but is is this document the best uh, relevance amongst all all the documents in this set so now i'll present a bunch of uh, so we'll we'll have an overview of uh, some of the existing models which are are uh, pretty popular uh, and also like contextualize them with respect to the point wise pair wise and list wise losses we looked at uh, so one pretty popular model is the dssm model deep structured semantic model where the idea is you take the query and you take each document pass them through a neural network but now you learn uh, the relevance between a query and document by measuring the cosine similarity between these embeddings so this is a sort of match or what they would call as a semantic match and now try to see if this relevance that you're calculating is correlated with the true relevance using like binary cross entropy uh so this sort of model was one of the first models to use neural networks for uh, for learning uh, on click data and this is the way it's formulated as a point wise loss because now you have like uh, each query document pair is uh, its relevance is learned separately so this is one kind of model and then recently we've also had more interesting models which don't uh, try to score a query document pair in isolation but instead they try to generate a score while taking the list wise context into account so this model deep list wise context model what it mainly used in the context of re ranking where you assume you have some base ranking is using a combination of uh, your uh, a neural network to score query documents but then also pass a pass it through a recurrent neural network to generate additional context which is fused back with the uh original network to generate scores so essentially what's happening here is that the score of a document has a list is leveraging list wise context from all the other documents that are present and these sort of models uh we look at a few more of them uh we do see uh performance gains coming up from, from these models and the main idea here is that document a can be a good match for query but if you put document a document b maybe document a is better than document b but if you put document a document c and c is super relevant then you ideally want to push document a score down so that way these are able to leverage this list wise context to sort of also adjust the score for document uh, which might be less relevant because there's some there's another document which is more relevant So, so maybe I, I uh, so these scores. Uh, yeah. Sorry, so these scores for every query. Uh, I, so, a score of a document D one for a particular query Q. Does that yeah. score change if if things in the context change, or the score is nearly right. the same? Are they universal scores, or are they always relative? They are now relative. 
I think, so if you look at DSSM, that, that is sort of, you know, it's not looking at any other documents when it scores a query document fail, right? Uh, but what we see is that looking at this list-wise context is helpful. Of course, now your scores are in, in are relative to other documents shown in the same set, uh, but it does help with the ranking performance. Um, and in the, in the same, uh, another model in the same kind of space is that uh, if you look at A, which is like simple query document scoring model, which is, which can be in the pairwise setting, you would basically have Q or D plus, say D plus is clicked and D minus is not clicked, and then you learn a pairwise loss. Uh, and what they looked at is how do we extend this so that now we pass D plus and D minus to a neural network. So now it can learn some interactions between positive, the features between a positive and negative document. So in some sense, we, uh, instead of just relying on the loss function to say these documents are all in the same, are presented to the user at the same time, we're also uh, allowing the network to learn these cross document interactions. So extending this sort of an idea, uh, what we also looked at is say, instead of just two documents, can we also learn say multivariate scoring, which is we learn interactions between uh, not just pairs of documents, but say triplets or higher order interactions uh, this diagram might be complicated, but overall the idea is that we sample subsets of a certain group size and uh, reaccumulate those scores. The idea is to, again the score for each document. We would like it to depend on the list-wise context. Uh, and we had a recent uh, we had a work last year which is an extent you know extension along the same uh, line of thought but where instead of using uh, just uh, feed forward neural networks we use a combination of self attention and feed forward neural networks to capture these cross document interactions which we call as document interaction network where basically the idea is that we use the attention mechanism to attend between any given document and the whole document set to generate a document interaction embedding, which in some sense says how, uh, how relevant is this document in with the whole context of the document set given. Uh, and we pass this to a traditional univariate scoring function to generate a score SI. What we're seeing is that having this additional uh, document interaction embedding can enhance any any uh, univariate scoring function over uh, all the standard benchmark data sets. What we've seen is we do get a good performance improvement. So overall, these class, uh, all these classes of uh, methods show that you could develop newer loss, you could focus on the loss functions, how like pointwise, pairwise, and distress losses. And you can also look at how to modify your neural network itself to, uh, to capture your uh, input information in, in a more richer way. Um, so, so very quickly, yeah. on the past slide, you essentially the interaction enabled us to compute new document embeddings for each of the documents in the context, and that new right. document embedding was used for the, the later part. Oh. Right, right. So Thanks. assume you know you were using, uh, you know, you had your tradition, you had a neural network where you were passing query document pair, but now you pass query document and a new document interaction embedding, which is jointly learned with the with the neural network but is using self-attention to learn uh, learn patterns across, you know, is D1, D2 similar or is D1, D3 similar? 
but it's able to leverage them. In a similar style, so this is inspired by transformers, where used on X data, where a word we're trying to generate, uh, which trying to generate embeddings, but which are contextualized to the entire uh, to the entire sentence. Yeah. Right. There's a question but here. Is a, uh, yeah, please. Yeah. So the first question is, how are we representing each document here, D1, D2? Can you give an example? Um, so one one example would be say uh, these are for each document we have say just the title information, right? So we think we can take the text and say pass it through BERT or you could even compute word embeddings for each one of them and average them. So the idea is that we are generating uh, fixed size embeddings for D1 to DN. You could also be looking at data sets like the web 30k data set where they have handcrafted features such, such as bm25 title length url length etc uh, and you know those are examples on how to represent each document either with uh, numerical features or with embeddings right so in the next question in dn score uh, in dn uh, the score will be a list of scores in comparison to all of the documents. Uh, so, so in DIN, what happens is for each, so the self-attention as such is applied D1 to DN cross D1 to DN. That, that's why we're calling it self-attention. Uh, but for each document, it's essentially generating uh, one score. So if you look at all documents, it generates a list of scores. Uh, but instead of generating a score, now it's generating an embedding because uh, you can use like the output of attention uh, is also like an embedding. So we are using this as sort of like an implicit feature to feed it to, uh, to your original scoring function. Right. Uh, the next question is, uh, also, what alternatives exist for univariate scoring functions? Does one of them usually better? Uh, does one of them usually work better than another? Right. A uh, great question. Uh, there is quite a bit of work in what kind of univariate scoring functions are good, even amongst neural networks. Of course, you could use like SVMs and gradient boosted decision trees, and linear networks, etc. Uh, even among neural networks. Uh, one candidate is to use like like a feedforward neural network. Say you use like feedforward uh, layer batch normalization and some non-linear activation and stack them. So that's uh, that's one kind of model. The other is to also do like these two tower models, which essentially pass. There's a query tower and there's a document tower, and then you take a dot product between both of them and you start to generate a score. Those are two popular classes. And then you have all these uh, list-wise context style models, which I just talked about. Uh, not just the document interaction network, but say the uh, rank prob model or the deep list-wise context model, etc. cetera. Um, right. The next question is query compared to all of D1, D2, D3, which get a rank score. Uh, not sure I understand this completely, but finally the output for each document DI is a score SI. Uh, so this is showing how it's applied for one query document pair, but you would apply it for all query document pairs and get the scores and then you do a sort. To, to get the rank list. Right. Um, another question is, e EI is uh, average of embeddings of all the respective documents. It's, so EI is a weighted average of embeddings of all the documents. And uh, the weights are where the attention Match and say is 
the embedding for DI and DJ, how similar are they? Uh, to, so that's used to compute, uh, right? Uh, this is the standard uh, attention mechanism uh, used in, say, transform uh, or other places. I, I, think, uh, I think the last few sentences uh, were very, uh, we couldn't hear them because connection was not clear. Oh, so sorry. Just the last part. Yeah, yeah sorry. Some, some issue with. Right. Yeah, sorry for my noisy uh, internet connection. Uh, what I was saying was that it's uh, it's a weighted average, and the weights are weights come from the attention mechanism, which sort of look at like a between how the documents are. Right. So yeah, another question is for ranking with neural networks, what we have to re-rank. During inference, we want to find rank docs for a given query. So 30k docs, we will have to pair the query with each of the 30k docs. The inference time will blow up. Um, right. So usually, I see. Right. Uh, this is this is a good point. So say you have. Uh, even in a real world scenario, when you're applying uh, all these learning to rank techniques, they're usually applied on top of some some base retrieval mechanism uh, because it's not really possible to run this uh, sort of ranking across your entire data set. So, for example, if you're doing web search, there's no way to rank all, uh, like do learning to rank style uh, thing on all URLs, right? That's just not possible. But then you have some retrieval mechanisms which are not necessarily machine learning based, right? It would be indexing, etc. Which surface a candidate pool, and then say these candidate pools are refined, and uh, either as a full ranking or re-ranking. That's when you apply this ranking with neural networks. Yeah, I hope right. that so answers just the question. Paraphrase. Yeah, just to paraphrase, so what we are talking about is, is on the very end of the pipeline, which is the ranking step, there, there is a cascade of steps that is that uh, documents are, are collected and filtered and, and eventually a, a, a small enough, a decently big but small enough pool is, is passed through the ranking right. stage, which is the most complex stage and which determines actually what you see on the, on the search results. But, but but a follow up question along the same lines would be that you know even matching embeddings uh, you know bird style embeddings at scale query is is, is hard right pair wise so so now you're talking about list and, and, and embedding them is this but the mechanism is very similar you, you can pass and you're working on parallel on GPUs so is, is this cost much higher compared to or what uh, uh, pairwise embedding and matching would do, or or is it comparable? Right, that's a good point. Uh, here, the cost is higher in the sense that, uh, say, if you're using something like BERT, uh, and then you have a list of documents, right? You're really expanding your batch size with also with an additional dimension now, uh, and then you have all these memory constraints depending on you're using a GPU or a CPU or TPU. So there are those constraints. So particularly if you talk about models, but look at list-wise context, like the document interaction network or other models, they, uh, in practice, I think you'll have to limit the window of the list-wise context, so to say, maybe look at only top. So now you're assuming there's some base ranking from, from your retrieval mechanism or elsewhere, but now you limit your context to be something that you can actually process. So there are all these yes. engineering uh, uh, constraints that come in when, when you want to actually train this model. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's one more question. Uh, right. What is the preferred approach for getting uh, DI for docs longer than max length of transformers? 
Um, yeah, this is a this is a good question. Um, I'm sorry. I think the the yeah the network connection uh, took over finally. It was trying for a long time. Um, oh, so, sorry. Yeah, please, Rama, if you could share share the slides again, uh, they they disappear. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can see the slides again. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, so, getting back to the question, I think uh, it is. So, I think this is a pretty uh, interesting question for in NLP in general, right? Like, how do we deal with very large scale sequences? Uh, it's something we're still exploring uh, in these, for like using these sort of listwise context models for ranking. Uh, but in general, I think if you have a attention mechanism which is more uh, scalable, then that can be used here. And there's been some recent work in like scalable attention, like the old performers, long performers. Uh, paper, like uh, interesting papers on how to scale up attention. Uh, so, so yeah, we've re what we've been doing so far is really restrict the size of this document set for attention to really be something that you can actually process. So it's more like a top K uh, cross attention that uh, that works well in uh, practice. Great. Um, any any other questions at this stage? What what is the preferred strategy for breaking uh, documents? So uh, on data sets which have like right. So we have been looking at. Passage uh, passage ranking where the passages are already pretty small. Uh, if you look at document ranking, then that's this is a slightly different problem. Uh, but so far, not really looked at embedding an entire document. Say that a document has like 1,024 tokens. Yeah, that's something uh, I don't think. I mean, just do Yeah, uh, I guess we have only five minutes. So, uh, so what I can do is I can give like. Uh, so I mean, it, let, let me. So it, it's completely okay uh, to extend if you have time. Otherwise, we could we could. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, it, it depends completely. We we have had uh, yeah because of these questions that we allow uh, and free flow format generally extends so. It, it depends on you completely uh, how far or how detailed you want to go into. Right. Uh, what I can do is, uh, I mean, so the, I mean, you, there are a lot of slides here, but not all of them need to be covered. This is really like a super set of slides I've been using. Uh, I can give like a quick five minute overview of the library, which is like a tool you can use for your own applications. Uh, Try to present a tab instead. So yeah, so what what I'll do is in the next uh, five to ten minutes, I'll just give a quick overview of the library itself and how you can use it for losses, metrics, etc., and building uh, using neural networks for scoring. So in in the lab, so. TF ranking, uh, TensorFlow ranking, it's a, lab, uh, it's a library for building uh, neural uh, learning to rank uh, models given your data set. So some of the challenges are in data representation. How do you represent data? Uh, because you can have for each, for different queries, you can have like rank lists of varying sizes. 
and also uh, looking at ranking losses and ranking metrics. So there were no inbuilt losses metrics in TensorFlow. So how do we uh, provide them as, as a library? And during serving time, uh, there might be a difference in training serving in the sense that during training, you, sh you train on say 10, 10 documents, document list of size 10, but during serving, you could be scoring say 100 or uh, you know, several hundred documents. So for the data representation problem, we, uh, we have a couple of data formats. One is called example and example, uh, and the other is called example list of context. Uh, I won't go into much detail here. Uh, we have more details on the, uh, on the GitHub repo, but essentially what we have is like we, uh, we have a, a list of, uh, or a set of examples for each document. And then we have additional context for the query features. And uh, we have a format, which is basically able to capture this list of examples and context information. And internally, the way it would be represented is you would have something of like number of queries, maximum number of documents, uh, and say for your relevance, you use, uh, you store whether it's relevant or not relevant, but you also store information of whether it's padded or not. And looking at the core components itself, we support uh, ranking losses. We support point-wise, pair-wise, and list-wise losses. We support popular ranking metrics, uh, like say mean reciprocal rank or normalized discounted cumulative gain, which are basically uh, different ranking metrics, which look at, uh, which emphasize getting the ranking correct, uh, correct in the top K versus getting it. So these metrics usually penalize ranking mistakes at the top versus penalizing them at the bottom of the list because you care more about performance at top K than uh, elsewhere. We also support multivariate scoring functions, mainly mainly the group-wise uh, scoring functions and uh, the document interaction network. It's also easy to use our framework to implement the other. We also support unbiased learning to rank, which uh, looks at a couple of data biases that come into how uh, say clicks are recorded because clicks can be noisy. Clicks can also be biased because users tend to documents present thousand and below. So we do support uh, uh, learning to rank techniques. They're somewhat advanced, so I won't cover them in this talk. Uh, and we also support sparse or embedding features where you are trying to learn directly from, from the data, from like directly learn embeddings from the data but which are, uh, which are fine tuned for like ranking loss. Um, and these are, you know, some of the popular metrics like average relevance position or mean reciprocal rank or uh, discounted cumulative gain. And we support several scoring functions. Uh, and this is something we've already covered where a univariate scores only a query document and uh, query document separately, the bivariate scores, pair of documents and multivariate scores, a group of documents. Um, yeah, these are uh, you know, how the loss, loss functions look like. And uh, we have some more work on how to directly optimize metrics. These are, uh, uh, again, maybe outside the scope of the current talk. But overall, this is this is how the library uh, fits into the overall TensorFlow ecosystem. That you know, you have your hardware, and then you have your Tensor, you know, TensorFlow's uh, execution engine, and there are Python ops, C plus plus ops, and we have provided support for uh, feature transformations, building a scoring function, uh, and then also for like how to. Uh, how to convert your data sets to this format, how to have, how to use ranking losses and ranking metrics. And this is how the overall architecture looks like. 
uh, during training, you can define many, several of these blocks on how to read in data, how to transform data, score, uh, build a scoring function, uh, use ranking losses and metrics, etc. So I'll stop here and maybe we can have a discussion. Uh, but we also have a demo. If you go to git.io slash PDF ranking demo, uh, we have a collab notebook you can play around with to to see how you can use uh, the library for for you know for for a for a particular uh, open source data set, and then you can customize it for. Um, Um, yeah, there's another question on, is there a paper on text chunk strategy for getting embeddings? Because if I break it at sentence level, it loses the surrounding context. And if I encode paragraph, the embedding is noisy. Would like to understand when to use DPR versus sentence transformers. Um, yeah, I think, I think these are very interesting questions. Uh, but more, I would say, on the NLP side than on on the ranking side, these do manifest because, you know, ideally if you can scale up uh, the number of, the size of documents you can uh, embed, uh, it's easier, we can rank more documents. Uh, but yeah, I would say that you will have to look at recent advances in uh, NLP to see what's going on there. Yeah, not, not this there is a suggestion from SJ you can look at. Um, yeah, that's uh, basically it from my side. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, drop me an email or uh, also you can visit our GitHub our GitHub page and post issues. Mm -hmm. uh, could could you uh, talk a bit about uh, you know how DF ranking is being used at Google? Can you um, talk about that? <laughs> uh, I'll so the, so our library has uh, gotten good internal and external adoption. We've actually had uh, people from several companies like Grubhub, LinkedIn, Spotify. Uh, reach out to us, discuss with us the use case. We also heard back from LinkedIn and Grubhub that they actually deployed it in the, the, the uh, use case. Um, even internally, we uh, we have had pretty good uh, success in deploying in various, uh, various products. That's something we actively work on. So yeah, I, I might not be able to give like exact details for some of them, but uh, uh, yeah, it's it it has proven to be useful, and uh, it is a pretty big focus for our team as well to work with various product teams internally and see if we can drive some impact. So uh, yeah, so thank you for uh, for taking us through. Uh, TensorFlow ranking and the various aspects of you know, doing ranking at scale. Um, if if somebody has, uh, so Pratik has a few more questions it's about the hiring process. I I guess he can get in touch with you. Or, uh, probably you can share an email or LinkedIn. Uh, uh, he can get in touch with with Rama on LinkedIn. Uh, Right. So there's a question from Yasser. Any comments on feature engineering for ranking problems? Right. Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I think yeah, feature engineering. There's so many uh, things uh, to look at. So a couple of points I would say. One thing is that uh, feature pre-processing can can be quite helpful. Uh, 
particularly since these features are being passed to uh, neural networks. So if your range of your features is pretty large, then it really helps if you can like normalize them, do like uh, Z scaling, uh, et cetera. There are also some transformations which have proven uh, useful to use with neural networks. Uh, so there's this symmetric log 1p transformation, which is something you can directly use with a neural network. But what it essentially does is if you have a distribution, feature distribution, which is uh, super unbounded, it makes it smoother and slightly more bounded. Uh, so that is uh, one thing. The other thing is, say, doing things like shared embeddings, shared embeddings, or uh, you can look at building queries. So queries and documents can share embeddings or not. Again, it's something you'll have to look at your particular scenario, but which are the features where you want to share embeddings? you don't want to share embeddings. Uh, these are not ranking specific per se, but I think uh, it's something I've encountered with, with that. Um, yeah, the last question, I, I mean, I don't think there's a lot I can say and uh, uh, there's a lot I don't know either. So if, uh, in the sense that I don't uh, know from my day-to-day -day job why Google search is so fast, uh, something I should first figure out. Uh, but yeah, it was uh, definitely great talking, uh, getting to interact with you all. And thanks, Nishan, for, for the opportunity. Th thank you, Rama. Uh, thank you so much for, for taking time and, and educating us about learning to rank and, and the tool. And, and thank you, everybody in the audience, for, for interacting so much and, and asking relevant questions and uh, yeah, making this a wonderful session. So thanks, everybody, and, and we'll, uh, we'll close this session. Um, thank you again for attending. Thanks, Rama. Thank you. Thanks, Nishan. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.